I'm United States Senator Pete Ricketts of Nebraska, and this is The Elephant in the Room. Welcome to The Elephant in the Room. I'm your host, Cyrus Pearson. I'm your co-host, Sophie Delquier. Our guest today was Senator Pete Ricketts from the great state of Nebraska. So that was a ton of fun. Cyrus, what did you think about Senator Ricketts? It actually was a ton of fun. He's one Whoa, of the, you sound surprised. Well, he's one of the newer senators, and I, I've worked with all the Republican senators for the last 22 years at this point, and I haven't gotten to interact with him much, so I wasn't sure how it was going to be. And he was so great to talk to that uh, we were having a hard time actually getting to the issues. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. Um, I'm just glad that my gift was well-received. You'll have to find out what it is. Oh, yeah. Stay tuned to hear what (laughs) Sophie gave him. Let's dig right in. Senator, thanks for joining us today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me on. I will be the Dungeon Master. In today's awesome. I love that. episode will be called PodQuest Unveiling the Mysteries of the Cornhuster. <laughs> <laughs> the listeners are probably thinking, what the heck? That is awesome. That is awesome. Uh, you, you're actually into Dungeons & Dragons. I have been into Dungeons & Dragons since I was in junior high school. Wow. Okay. And there have been uh, gaps when I haven't been playing, but then I had kids and got to introduce them to it and start the whole thing all over again. So, Can you explain how... How that works and what type of game that is. So Dungeons and Dragons is a role-playing game. So you have a guy called the or a woman called the Dungeon Master, okay. who creates a world with different quests in it, as you referenced. Okay. And then you have player characters who are the other players. And basically the Dungeon Master is a storyteller that lays out what the player characters will go through, and then the player characters have to work together to overcome obstacles, solve riddles, that sort of thing. And as they accomplish tasks and complete missions, they become more proficient in their skills and they get better at their jobs, like we hope everybody does. Yeah. <laughs> and actually, one of the cool things about Dungeons and Dragons, at least I think, is... One that, of the cool things. One of the cool things. There's many <laughs> cool things about it. Well, it's, uh, it teaches people to, like cooperation, yes. yeah. leadership. It, it does. And actually, you need a group of diverse skill sets to be able to be successful by and large. So, for example, if you had an entire party of dwarven fighters, you're probably not going to be successful because you only have one skill set. Okay. But if you have a diverse group that includes like dwarves and elves and humans, and you also have fighters and magic users and thieves and things like that, you, you have a diverse group of different skill sets, you're more likely to be successful. Are you so, sold, <coughs> Sophie? I'm sold. Honestly, this sounds fun. It's, but to be clear, yeah. it's not an online game. There are online games, as okay, a matter of fact. Okay, that's what I thought. The technology, it didn't used to be that right. way. Back in the old days, right. it was all paper and pencil, and you were in a room yeah. together. Now, my kids play online all the time. Either there's computer games, right. like Baldur's Gate 3, that you can play Dungeons & Dragons, and that you don't need another, you don't need anybody else, because it's just a game you can play by yourself. Though okay. you can play multiplayer with other people, too. Or Zoom has allowed Dungeons & Dragons players from all over the world to be able to play together. Oh, nice. So that's isn't what that crazy? Saying. Yeah. Good point. So that that's kind of one of the crazy things. Like, again, back in my day, you had to get all your buddies together to play yeah. on a Saturday afternoon, would it be? And if some people couldn't be there, it was kind of a problem. Right. But now you can do it on Zoom. And so, like, my son will play at, like, 2 in the morning to make sure the guy from Japan can be a part of it or something like that. I'm just... Really not that I neat. recommend that, but yeah. <laughs> how, how much setup? Because I play Candyland with my daughter. She's she's a little young. There's not much setup involved in that. I mean, how much planning do you have to put into this game? For the Dungeon Master, a lot. Okay. okay. So, because you have to basically create a world. So think about it. You're almost like a writer who is the best Dungeon Masters, especially, will create a world that you you know suspend your disbelief and believe it's real. That you're part of this world and you actually care about it. And so that takes a lot of work from coming up with, well, what is the world like and who are the key powers in it to tr- drawing the, the city maps or whatever, sure. wherever, the, wherever the gameplay is going to take place. And a lot of it can be kind of theater of the mind where you're describing stuff, but you can also draw things out on paper or, you know, build, you know, you can get, there's also, you know, sell uh, little models of stuff that you can Okay. Yeah. Have little characters on and stuff like that to be able to help people visualize it more, or you can right. just draw it out, on, you know, on a piece of paper. So there's a lot of different ways to do it, but it's a lot of work for the dungeon master. For the players, it's probably less work. You have to create a character, but then it's just the game time involved in being present. So okay, so you buy this game. Does it come with costumes? It does not come with. Costumes. <laughs> okay, I'm like, what? What do people so, wear? But there are, but there are. <laughs> All sorts of conventions where you can create the oh, or like uh, Renaissance fairs. Right, right. Like you can go to a Renaissance fair and I've you can dress up for that. Go. So there you go. Yeah. 
Now, that's not actually playing Dungeons and Dragons, but you get to dress up. <laughs> so, and typically people don't dress up when they're playing Dungeons and Dragons. Okay. But, when, but they've got all sorts of books, and you got to buy all sorts of dice. And I mean, there's just so there's lots of things you can buy, but costumes are generally not one of them. Okay. I'd actually like to talk about this for another 15 minutes, but let's, <laughs> let's move on to something else because you don't just use your mind and all those things. Well, let's skills. go back to Dungeons and Dragons. That is <laughs> okay, what do you have? A 120 sided die? I don't even understand this. They do have 20 sided die, though. I never even knew there were 20 sided die before I started playing Dungeons and Dragons. I, I, I just learned that yeah. with you and right a, now. One of them is a duo decahedron. Is that the 20 sided oh. die? I don't know. Wow. Yeah, there duo is a fan on the spot there. Yes, yeah. that could be the, t- yeah, because duo isn't that a fancy deca. Term? Yeah. There you yeah go. if I hopped on Google, I'd tune out. So I'll, I'll just. Right, right, right. Don't, don't use the phone. <laughs> no, don't use the phone. It's, it's going to stay right here on the table. Be present, Cyrus. <laughs> All right. So you do physical activities, too. You do Peloton. I love my Peloton. Okay. And you have a goal for this year? 24,000 minutes. Okay. That's that insane. Doesn't make much sense. It's about 65 minutes a day. Okay. Wow. So, that's... But then if you miss, you got to make it up some other way, <gasps> right? So When you break that down, that's 400 hours. My math is usually off, but I think this is right. 16.6 straight days this year of Pelotoning. I actually haven't done the math that way. So but, I don't want to intimidate yeah, but you. See, but if you break it up to like an hour a day, right? then it's just like, oh, that's just I'm being healthy. Not yeah. obsessive. An hour a day. Not for... obsessive, as some of my friends have <laughs> accused me of being. <laughs> uh, I know they have shirts for 1,000 minutes. Are you trying to get 24 of those? No, they stopped that policy. So oh. I did get my shirt, because I've had my Peloton since I started riding in 2018. Okay. okay. So actually, my brother bought it for me for Christmas of 2017. And I usually ride my bicycle outside. In Nebraska during the winter, though, that can be tough. Right. Yeah. Like, I would ride throughout all the winter and just try and dress appropriately but sometimes it snows and yeah. i've tried riding my bike in the snow it's not fun it's a bad idea especially the little skinny tire bikes like yeah. fat tires you can probably get away with not skinny tires you fall over um well you because what happens is you get on the snow and you, you're pedaling and your back wheel stops turning as right. soon as you stop your forward motion you just fall over uh, i don't have a peloton but i have a regular bike yeah. i have a cerevelo a okay. road bike all right yeah. so i love my ride my regular bicycle outside yeah so my brother got me this and i'm like well what do i need an inside bike for i got another one i got one i already don't like that i ride in the winter <laughs> and so the first day i went to get on and asked me for a credit card i didn't get the whole peloton thing at the time mm-hmm. yeah and i'm like why do i need a credit card for an inside bike mm-hmm. so i blew it off that day came back the next day with my credit card and i've been in love ever since wow I know that they have different instructors that do yeah. this live with you. We have somebody here who's on the other side of this, our, our producer, Elena, and she is huge into Peloton. We had like yeah. a 20-minute conversation. Do you have a favorite instructor in case there are people out there who might recognize so them? So typically, I play 80s music. So I'm not so much on the instructor, but oh. on the genre of music, specifically 80s music. So Leanne Hainsby plays a lot of that. But Matt Wolpers is a great instructor. Uh, Sam Yo plays a lot of 80s music. Dennis Morton. Wow. Um, I mean, you, okay, it's kind of crazy. You kind of get to feel like you know, like, oh, Ellie Love got engaged. Yeah. <laughs> or Robin Arizon had a baby. You know, it's like, seriously, you get to start to know these people. Yeah. It's kind of a weird thing because in reverse, people kind of got to know me that way, especially during the pandemic because I was yeah. doing daily press conferences. Right. And so they kind of got to feel like they knew me even though I'd never met them. I've got that same thing for um, the, instructors. Uh, the instructors. Like That's Jennifer so funny. Sherman. Kind of, she's close to my age. She's got kind of a potty mouth. Like, <laughs> oh no! Clean up the language here, Jennifer. Let's go. Wouldn't fly in the Senate. But she's my age. So she plays a lot of classic rock and '80s music. So anyway, so, <laughs> so it's kind of funny. funny. Yeah. I've never met any of them though. Right. I've never yeah. been to any of the. Stu- I have never been to any of the Peloton studios to do it. I do it all at home or whatever. But uh, it's kind of funny. Like you kind of feel like you know these people. Yeah. So, so what do you love about cycling and Pelotoning so much? Well, exercise yes. right is an important part of anybody being healthy and happy you know got to have a healthy mind healthy body healthy spirit so the exercise is a a way to stay healthy and also kind of handle stress and all that sort of thing so um, I had my knee replaced Mm. back in 2015 I heard it back in college and eventually had my ACL replaced and had to have my knee replaced and so I can't really run so my doctor said you can yeah cycle or swim and getting into a cold pool at Five o'clock in the morning didn't sound appealing, so I opted for the cycling part of it. That's so this is when cycling. you fit it in because you're really busy. Five in the morning is when you do this? Yeah, typically I get up uh, at 5 or 5.30 to get my bike right in before I start the day. Wow. And, and it's p- personal curiosity of mine, but how has the replacement gone? Oh, it's gone great. It's been great. Like one of the best decisions I ever made. Yeah. Because 
I did have a, I, when I first went to go get this done, I had one doctor said, well, you know, if you're older, I'd tell you not to do it. If you're younger, I'd tell you to do it. I'm like, well, that's not really helpful. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and uh, then uh, actually my regular general practitioner said, hey, here's somebody in Chicago who has a new technique that doesn't cut the muscle or tendon. Oh. So I'm like, and actually, so it was totally cool. I, like, think about it. They're literally cutting your leg in half when mm-hmm. they're taking any out. Yeah. And I was up walking. I got my sur- surgery was like at 7.30. I was up walking by noon. Really? Walking stairs by noon, yeah. Oh, my yeah. gosh. And then, and then out, of, out, of, out by 1 o'clock. The technology wow. Total outpatient surgery. I know, Totally. Yeah, and then I was back to work on Monday. Like, I had the surgery on Thursday, I was back to work on Monday. Wow. I, I know a lot of people who ended up doing Peloton, though, or, or just cycling, because running just puts such, such pressure on your joints. It's actually bad for your knees. Yeah. yeah it turns out it's bad for your knees, especially when you yeah. get older. So yeah. it's a bad idea. Yeah. Well, let's talk about another thing that I don't know how much you're using your knees or how much you're lying down, but besides using your intellect for Dungeons & Dragons or working out with Peloton or cycling, you're a big turkey hunter? I love turkey hunting, yeah. Okay. Now, a lot of people, I, I'm not personally a turkey hunter, but uh, they don't realize it, it is actually tough to hunt a turkey, right? I yeah. didn't know that. Yeah, it is. Okay. So turkeys have very keen eyesight mm. and good hearing. They don't really have a sense of smell. So actually, it was my cousin who taught me how to turkey hunt or got me into turkey hunting. Yeah. And this was years and years ago. And so he's a smoker. So we'd be in the blind and he'd be smoking. <laughs> Apparently turkeys can't smell the smoke. I actually That's thought great. that was one of the reasons why we were not very successful, but <laughs> whatever. So, um, but yeah, turkeys, uh, so you have to, like in the springtime, you can call them in because that's when they're mating. Mm-hmm. So you get decoys out there and you try to call them in. And uh, in the fall, you can just try and stalk them. And that's also fun. So, but they are, they're, 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 they've got keen eyesight, so it's hard to sneak up on So us. how close okay. can you get? So, again, if you're going to use a shotgun, you can be farther away. Uh, with if, if you're going to use a bow and arrow, and I've done archery hunting, you have to really be like 15, 20 yards away. Okay. Wow. But with a shotgun, you can reach out to 40, 50 yards. So what do them. you like to do? Do you like to, and, and do you stalk them? So when I got my son into turkey hunting, we... Um, Bow hunting in a blind with two bow hunters is hard. So mm-hmm. we and he didn't want to do that. So we, I switched over to shotgun, and I, I will say that my uh, success rate went up dramatically. <laughs> 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 uh. Bow hunting is really hard. So um, so so typically I just go out with a shotgun now. So, okay. And I, I just had like one of the best turkey hunts ever. Okay. So if you got if we got a couple minutes, sure. here. so well, here's what happened. Yeah. I got. Can, can I can I preface this yeah. with how big a turkey gets? Do you know how how big they are? Uh, a male turkey can get no. up to four feet tall. Is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, no, I just assumed you, they were big dumb birds. You can breast out. Uh, I mean, they 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 can weigh. You know, I don't know. I've never put them on a scale, but forty pounds or fifty wow. pounds. Wow. Wow. They can be heavy. All right, sir. So, let's hear this story. All right. So anyway, <laughs> so this season, first weekend, I got a Jake, which is a younger male. Okay. You can only hunt males in the spring. And there was a big tom, so that's an older male who's get, who had a nice long beard. So turkeys grow this like a, a, like a, almost like a hairy beard out of their chest, and that's one of the ways you know if you got a nice turkey mm-hmm. a longer beard. Okay. They also can have spurs on the back of their things, like claws at the back of their uh, feet that can be as long as an inch, inch and a half. And if you get something that long, again, that's a cool turkey. So there was a big tom that I was looking all season long. Didn't get him. Last weekend, I'm out with a buddy of mine because he hadn't got any turkeys all year round. We got him a jig. Didn't look like anybody else was going to show up the rest of the day. So we packed up the tent, you know, the, t- the blind, threw it in the, uh, in the back of my truck, and we were just, like, going to go, you know, shoot uh, a rifle he brought. Yeah. And as we're driving down this unpaved road, we heard a gobble. And so I stopped the car, and we heard it again. And so I said to my buddy, hey, go back around, the, go behind the truck, Call the turkey. I'm going to belly crawl up to it and see if I can get it. Because <laughs> it sounded like my big turkey. Okay. So he does that, and the turkey, and there's a stream, and the turkey won't come across the stream, but I belly crawl through the grass, and you can see my trail afterwards. You can see where I, right where I went. Belly That's crawl amazing. through the grass, down the embankment, which is about a 12 foot embankment, across the stream, up the other side, belly crawl along the grass, up behind a dead tree trunk. And I look out behind one side, and there's a turkey. I kind of was worried he'd maybe see me. And so I crawl into a standing position and pop out from about 30 yards, shoot him and got him. (gasps) And so, yeah, it was like one of the funnest hunts I've ever done Uh... because I was stalking him and had to do all that stuff. Now, I will say that (laughs) he looked a lot bigger when I was looking at him from the end of my barrel than when I actually got to him. Oh, no. (laughs) (laughs) It wasn't quite the big trophy I thought it was going to be. He was still a very nice Tom. 
But uh, but it was a totally fun hunt. Wow, congratulations. So, that sounds amazing. So do you eat these turkeys? Yeah. Then you, uh, well, that one, actually, I'm going to get mounted. So okay. if you're going to mount them, you don't eat them. Okay. But typically, when I shoot most of my turkeys, much to my wife's chagrin, I breast them out and yeah. put them in. And, uh, like, turkey meat from a wild turkey has got more substance to it than a regular turkey, a farm-raised turkey. Okay. So the, the meat is firmer, if you want. Okay. And a little so, gamier, maybe? or No, not really gamier. Okay. It doesn't really taste bad. I love frying up in strips okay. and deep fat frying them. <laughs> My wife does not love that. That's also so amazing. So she, she banned me from that with, like, oil grease. She yeah. got me a air fryer, so it would do it that way. Oh, so yeah. that's actually pretty good. But you can also, like, put it in a Cuisinart or whatever and turn it into, like, taco meat or chili oh, meat. It's wow. really good that's for that because it's actually, idea. in my opinion, it's got more... It, it hangs together better than like ground beef. Like it's it's a right. little bit more substantive than ground beef. That's right. Yeah. I guess you can buy a bunch of ground turkey at the grocery store these days. Yeah, but it's a common. You know. Well, while we're on the subject of food, uh, this might be completely out there, but Sophie heard something. I did. I, I'm afraid that someone was pulling a prank on me and and told me this little tidbit, and it might be totally wrong. Um, but I heard that you carry a bottle of something with you around specifically at lunchtime. Oh, uh, my Frank's Red Hot Sauce? Well, I got you one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, very good. Thank you very much. So it's a, very, it's a fresh one for you. <laughs> so, okay, so thank you. So, in fa- matter of fact, I was carrying this around when we went to lunches because here's what I've been told. So take this with a grain of salt. Like the, 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 the people that do the catering have not confirmed this with me, but I like it because it's a good story and never let the truth get in the way of a good story. Of course. I always <laughs> so, say that. I'm so right. glad to hear you say that. So the Democrats <laughs> apparently have all their... Uh, nutritional requirements, right? Gluten-free, or I only eat salmon, or whatever it is. Vegan. It's like, right, exactly. Uh. And it's like 50 different orders, I've been told. Okay. Wow. The Senate, the Republican, the Senate Republicans' requirements is there must be something fried to eat. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> so, I love it. So there's usually, like, we actually, like, once every week or two, we have Cajun fried chicken, which I love fried chicken. So Frank's Red Hot Sauce works for that, or... If they do something else that's fried, like the shrimp or something like that, it works great for that. So there you I'm go. Bringing my own bottle of red hot sauce. Well, first of all, I will say um, they've really been nice. And like Teresa in there is really great. I told her I liked hot sauce when I first got here, so she tried different hot sauces. Oh. It was very sweet, but it wasn't Frank's. So I started bringing my own, and then they said, oh, "Senator, you don't have to bring in your own hot sauce." <laughs> We'll get you French red hot sauce. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I gave them my bottle, and they've, oh, been, then they've been buying more as we've been using it up. I will say though, I I really do like Frank's uh, red hot sauce. It it has more wow. flavor. That's cool that you actually got the right one yeah. too, because there is a oh, Louisiana yeah. hot sauce too, which is also very good. But uh, that's the OG yeah. for me. That that's the one that I like yeah. as well. So you put that on everything, and I did say stuff. <laughs> good. Okay. Good. No swearing in the Senate. <laughs> Senator, uh, you are a blast to talk to, and I feel like we could go and eat up all our time without ever getting to anything you're doing. But let's talk about. Some yeah, I was, of the I was actually stalling. I so. <laughs> yeah. want to. We I've been here six months, about... so I don't have a lot I can point to right <laughs> well, now. Well, you, you. No, no. I mean, <laughs> listeners, he was governor of Nebraska, and um, one of the things we have here is you working on. This is a mouthful. Proven Nebraska solutions ready for America. But essentially, solutions you proved worked as governor of Nebraska to the Senate. Can you go into that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. So as governor, one of the things I've really focused on is how can we do a better job of providing services to the people of Nebraska? That was really what I ran on, the business person who was going to come and run government like a business. And so we did. Took a, we implemented a, a process improvement methodology called Lean Six Sigma to be able to streamline our operations you know, take out the useless steps of things that don't add value, and by doing that, provide better service. So be able to get permits out faster or reduce on hold times or put firms uh, put forms online so people don't have to wait in line, that sort of thing. And so that's really what we're looking for is what are the things we did at the state of Nebraska that then we can bring to Washington, D.C.? Mm-hmm. One of those programs, which was the first bill I introduced, was called the SNAP Next Step Act of 2023, so SNAP stands for, for Supplemental Nutritional Assistance Program, otherwise known as food stamps, right? So in Nebraska, what we did is we took our job coaches in the Department of Labor, offered them to our families on SNAP to help them get, you know, preparation for interviews, how to write a resume, how to look for a job. Do you need more education? And really get people prepared to take that next best job. We also created a benefits calculator to make sure that people would be able to know Hey, I don't have to worry about taking this job because I'm going to make more than my benefit than what I'm getting from SNAP. Because as you, you know, when you're the more you make on SNAP, the less you get 
mm-hmm. you know, the less your benefit is. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a good system. You right. want to reduce that. But so you want to make sure the families are all better off, right? Mm-hmm. So we created a calculator to make sure they would. And that's what we did. And we've helped hundreds of families in Nebraska. The average increase in their income has been $25,000. Mm, wow. wow. 25000 So the family's got to stick through it. But we've helped hundreds of families do that. And that's the average increase. And that means also about 60% of those families have eliminated their need for SNAP. Oh, so okay. So they're off food stamps completely. They've helped themselves out of this situation. Exactly. Okay. Mm. 40% have reduced their need for SNAP. And so if you look at the average monthly benefit for these families, it dropped from $508 a week, or a month rather, to $179 a month. Mm. So it's a win-win-win for everybody, right? The family gets a better job. And, and also it improves the quality of life. So oftentimes you have single parents who are getting full-time jobs during the day rather than working part-time jobs at night so they can be home with their kids. Right. Right. So huge improvement to quality of life from that standpoint, as well as the financial aspect. Um, like I was talking, we were talking to some of the folks, uh, some of our teammates back in the state of Nebraska, you know, our uh, folks who work for the state mm-hmm. who help these families. And they go, yeah, you know, we get comments like, I have money left at the end of the month. Or I paid all my bills and I still have money left. You know, things like that. Like stuff that some of us might take for granted, but Mm -hmm. if you're a family living paycheck to paycheck, you don't, No, right? And now these families actually have money left at the end of the month, which is awesome. Which many people don't, I mean, these days with, you know, quote unquote, Bidenomics. Yeah, inflation. (laughs) Bidenflation, yeah. Yeah. So like we had a woman, April Clausen, uh, again, single mom. She actually, we actually, through this program, helped her get her associate's degree two days before her youngest child graduated from high school. And actually, she's working for the state of Nebraska now, helping other families be able to take advantage of the program. Very so nice. the whole idea is I introduced a bill to basically allow other states to use what we did in Nebraska. Uh, it doesn't cost any more money because what we're doing is the bill says that you can use the administrative fees that are already baked into SNAP. So there's 5% administrative fees. You can use those fees to get people into the program and help pay for the stuff. And then also let them know you can use those administrative fees to create a benefits cal- calculator. It's not a requirement. Mm-hmm. You know, this is a may do. But uh, also just say, hey, do this because you can use those administrative fees to create this calculator. And that will help overcome any objections people may have or concerns. And will also you know, let you know that the families you're helping are going to be better off. That's great. Uh, I'm going to move on just so we can cover as many things as possible, but you're going to introduce a bill uh, focusing on evening the playing field uh, on EV mandates. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the things that I find the Biden administration is really half-hearted about is renewable fuels. Like if you really want to take carbon out of the environment, you would think they would be all over renewables. And their support is lukewarm, tepid at best. And so what this bill does is make sure that flex fuel vehicles, which can use, say, 85 percent ethanol mixed Mm -hmm. with gasoline, are getting the same credits as electric vehicles. Mm -hmm. And the thing about it is we actually have a whole distribution system for using renewable fuels. It's called gas stations. (laughs) They already exist. We don't have to create new ones. And uh, the EVs require that we have charging stations. And, And frankly, it's just not practical in states like Nebraska to drive an EV very easily outside of Lincoln and Omaha. We've got highways with hundreds of miles with no charging stations. So, and trust me, if you've got a three-year-old, you really don't want to stop oh, for two yeah. hours, two hours, or tw- even 20 minutes while your, your EV is charging, right? So uh, w- there are other solutions out there, and flex fuel vehicles can be a part of that solution if you're looking to reduce, you know, the greenhouse gases. Uh, I should have brought my notes in, but my recollection is somewhere like you're going to, re- if you, you're, bl- you know, if you're using... Um, E85, actually it's even less than that. I think if you're at uh, a lower volumes of ethanol, mm-hmm. you're going to reduce your car, your greenhouse emissions by like 45% wow. over a traditional vehicle using regular gasoline. And like when, uh, so here's the things I always tell people about ethanol. It's going to save you money at the pump. So the last time I filled up last week, I was saving 45 cents a gallon on 87 octane gasoline versus the regular 87 octane. I could use that. 45 cents a gallon. It's going to clean up the environment, reduce Greenhouse gas emissions, nitrous oxide, particulate matter, carbon black, all that stuff goes down. And it also helps our farmers and ranchers. Yeah. And Nebraska's an agricultural state, so that's a big deal for us. Yeah. Yeah, that, that segues nicely into our next topic. I'm sorry yeah. that I'm pushing these. But and, and before you Can go. Can we go back and talk about Dungeons and Dragons? <laughs> I know, I know, I know. I love to. <laughs> huge ag state. I cannot emphasize that enough. 
just stating that. Go ahead, Sophie. Well, I was just going to say, not to, I mean, what I really like about this bill, too, is, oh, you know, sorry. this just highlights, um, no, that's okay. This this bill highlights kind of the hypocrisy in the Biden administration. Absolutely. So much of the electrical stuff they want to do is really outsourcing it to China, who, by the oh, way, manufactures all this green energy in massive coal plants. I mean, it's like. It is crazy what yeah. they want to do. You know, for example, you can create 90 hybrid vehicles for the same sort of rare earth knowledge you need in one EV. Wow. So why don't we try to, like, again, yeah. I'm not saying EVs are bad. And actually, if you've driven an EV, they're pretty cool. They yeah. got massive yeah. acceleration. Teslas are gorgeous. Yeah, well, they're gorgeous <laughs> and they drive really fast. fast. Yeah. They accelerate fast. But it's just not practical to convert everybody yeah. over to that. And I was just talking to a car dealer yesterday, and they're like, yeah, here in Nebraska, you're not going to find that you're going to sell two-thirds of your vehicles going to be EV by 2032. People don't want them. Right. right. Not that many people want them. Right. So other alternatives like hybrids, where you can make 90 of them for the the materials you need in one battery operated car when it comes to those critical minerals. And then knowing right. that China, you know, they control or process like 80% of all the rare earth elements. I think they have 50% of all the lithium and process 60% of it. Cobalt yep. is even higher. Right. And I would tell you, talking to the Biden administration, whether it's Michael Regan at the EPA, Joseph Goffman, his air administrator, anybody else, they have not done the math to know how much new power generation we'll need, how much transmission lines we'll need. What Nobody's done, to my knowledge, yeah. I've asked, nobody's said, oh, yeah, we've done a whole survey of all of our allies and where the rare earth elements are. And here's right. our, Nobody's done that. Yeah. They are throwing this out there, their tailpipe emission standards, with no planning. And they are guaranteed to fail because they, they're just, the incompetence administration just goes on and on and on after, like, we could we could transition that into passports or right. you know all the other things where they're just like just failing to deliver on basic planning or operational things and this is a great example of like they throw this out there for an agenda there are other solutions out there like we talked about the hybrids or renewables right and their 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 enthusiasm for those things is tepid it back which ma makes it seem like well you really don't care about taking out carbon you just have an agenda right that's kind of way it seems to me they don't care about carbon they really care about their agenda so speaking of china and and this actually ties in really well with you know the ag direction that you want to go in um something that you did as governor that is kind of carrying into the senate uh i did not know this but you were the first to ban TikTok on state devices in nebraska and you moved the state trade office from shanghai to germany um you i think maybe this week we're briefed by the FBI. Can you tell us what you discussed um, in terms of well, the threat I, I want to go China. back because you got me started on China thing. Yeah. So I'm really, here's another thing too. Why would we make ourselves dependent on our adversary, the People's Republic of China? The Chinese Communist Party is an existential threat to our country. We, because of the innovation in this country around the shale revolution, were able to not become dependent on OPEC. That was a great thing. And now the Biden administration wants to make us dependent on a country that is creating all sorts of problems for us. They steal our IP. They just hack the commerce secretaries. And yet the Biden administration's policy is just to appease them. So, yes. Yeah, so, or bow. Yeah. <laughs> so it really, I just, it's infuriating yeah. the, the mismanagement and the incompetence of the Biden administration on how we're handling the People's Republic of China. But getting back to, uh, you know, I did trade missions to China and 2015 and 2016, and it really started opening up my eyes. And then President Trump came in and started talking about his stuff. So TikTok, we were the first state to ban that in 2020 so that we wouldn't be giving away our information, at least on state devices. And then I moved my trade office from Shanghai to Germany because I said, the, China's a bad trade partner, so we're, we don't want to trade with them anymore. And so it's great. we moved it to Germany because we saw, oh, we actually have lots of good trade with Germany, and they're good trade partners. And then, um, you know, we've got all sorts of, th uh, broadly, all sorts of threats from the CCP in Nebraska, whether you're talking about the new Sentinel program, which is, you know, a new, the next version of our ICBM missiles in western Nebraska. Mm -hmm. STRATCOM, that controls all of our nuclear forces, <clears throat> is in Bellevue, Nebraska. You've got the University of Nebraska. You've got, um, you know, all sorts of things that the CCP would love to be able to steal. Oh, uh, agriculture. You mentioned we're an agricultural right. state. Uh, we know that spies from the CCP are have stolen our intellectual property on this. In fact, we caught one of the guys as he was boarding a plane with hybrid steeds, seeds he stole. Are you serious? Yeah, totally. Wow. Like, this was a few years ago and it was in Iowa. But mm -hmm. yeah, totally, he, had, he had come to this country as a spy and st was stealing this information, had the seeds, had the IP, was getting on a plane, and the FBI nabbed him. Wow. So this threat is very real. Mm -hmm. And the solution is not to appease them, you know, try to cover up the Chinese spy balloon so Blinken can go over to China, right? That's a bad idea. 
what they understand and respect is strength. And so the, we should be taking a much harder line with them. And at any time, like, say, I don't know, the Commerce Secretary's um, you know, email yeah. gets hacked, we should say, oh, John Kerry, you're not going to China. Mm-hmm. And, in fact, we should start punishing them by, like, what are the, figuring out what are the things they care about and then hitting where it hurts for them. Because that's the only way they're going to start. I mean, this is a, you know, a thing where if we act with strength, they will respect that and they will start treating us more like an equal. Right now, the CCP thinks that we're a hollowed out entity mm-hmm. and that we're in decline. And so they're going to continue to take advantage of us, especially if we just keep projecting weakness. That only just feeds what they believe about us. I'm hearing this over and over again from the men and women who come in here and sit sit here, is mm-hmm. that we need to project the strength. Where, where, What direction do you think that's going in? Well, with this administration, it's going down. I mean, look at all the things that Biden is doing to appease the Chinese. Um, it, it's not doing, I mean, look, and this, you know, let's go back to World War II, right? Neville Chamberlain holding up the piece of paper, peace in our times. Well, all that did was encourage Hitler to go take other countries, right? If you want to prevent war, you have to do it from a position of strength. Ronald Reagan knew that, right? He said that he's been, well, I don't know how many wars in his lifetime there were, three or four wars in his lifetime. He said none of them were because we were too strong. Mm-hmm. Right. It's be all because we project a weakness and our adversaries thought they could take advantage of us. So can we get back to a point where we're projecting strength like it needs to be projected? Absolutely. As soon as we kick Biden out of office, we can get there. Yeah. <laughs> there's, there's your answer. There's your we answer. have hope. Yeah. <laughs> let, let me bring up this term agricultural espionage. Yeah. Yeah. That's oh, wait, what I, I mispronounced about. both those agriculture espionage. Yeah, yeah. That's what we're talking about. We're okay. talking about them trying to steal our IP. But also think about this, too. Another threat is all of our combines and stuff like that they're all connected to the internet with satellites and stuff like that and that's how we do precision agriculture okay so it's access to you know the cloud and big data to really make sure that you can get it down to like the square foot and make sure you're getting the right amount of water on it the right amount of seed in it the right amount of pesticides whatever you want to do right amount right. of nitrogen so we need that well we know the ccp is looking at how to disrupt that how can they interrupt that? Because if you shut down our connection from our combine to, say, the Internet, that combine, I mean, the farmer turns off the combine and stops mm-hmm. because that's how important it is. Right. So we need to protect our infrastructure. And, um, you know, I, and I, the FBI is working with uh, organizations like the F- Nebraska Farm Bureau to be able to do that, to be able to help educate our farmers and ranchers about what steps they need to do to protect their data. In the last four or five minutes we have, unless you have something other than this, Sophie, I, I would like to I got actually, my China fix. <laughs> I'd, I'd actually to like to talk about Nebraska. I mean, it is it is pretty central in, in the country. It's right smack tr- in the middle. Yeah. Triple yeah. landlocked state, right? Oh, how, we're the only triple one? Yeah. yeah. Meaning it's encircled <laughs> by three states on either side from the nearest Gulf, Bay, or Ocean. Um, so you might think, okay, well, maybe it's flat, maybe it's not. It's actually the first place I rode a horse. But there's a lot to like about Nebraska. Oh, I love Nebraska. We've got the best place in the world. Can we talk about the beef and why it's so tasty? Sure. Nebraska is a beef state. So that is our number one industry in Nebraska. So if you look at – I'll give you broad numbers. Nebraska's GDP is about $100 billion. Hmm. Agriculture is about $25 billion of that. I think, it's, I think it's 26 now. And beef is like six of agriculture. So it's the single biggest segment within agriculture. So right. it's the single biggest industry we've got in our state. So we are the beef state. And it is the best beef in the world because of the history and genetics. Like, you know, this is where the beef industry, you know, really grew up in this country, going mm-hmm. back to the cattle drives, you know, going to sure. all the railheads that were in Nebraska. The climate, because it gets cold, that's mm-hmm. when beef add on. You know, the fat that makes it taste really good. It does get cold. I By can't way, and, then, and then, of course, we got the corn, which we can actually turn into ethanol. By the way, when you're, when you're making ethanol, you are not depriving the world of food because the byproduct, distiller grains, goes to feed cattle, mm. right? Oh, or there you go. pigs or anything else you want to feed. So we got a great synergy there. And so you got a great food source. You got abundant water. Uh, you ha- and then, of course, you have just the best people in the world who are. I always say our farmers and ranchers were the original conservationists because they wanted to pass on the family farm or ranch to the next generation. So they had to take care of the land and their animals. I love that. To be able to do it. So you have many farms and ranches that were fourth, fifth, sixth generation. And so you just have all these things come together to create the best beef in the world. And I know that sounds like I'm just promoting, but I we have gone to <clears throat> like London and had taste tests with like 
grass-fed beef. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh my gosh. No, oh, it tastes bitter. It's terrible. Our yeah. our beef is sweet and rich. So, I mean, so everyone's like, oh, grass-fed beef, and I'm like, well, that's what Australia does because they don't have a choice, right? But like, the reason we feed corn to cows is because it puts the fat on there. The fat's what makes it exactly. taste good. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> that's, yeah. That's what tastes good. I actually, I literally two nights ago had a quite chewy grass-fed beef steak. I hope my boyfriend doesn't hear this because he's the one who grilled it, but. <laughs> <laughs> Probably cooked it too long, too. Yeah. I actually used to say the beef state on the uh, license plates, I believe. Yeah, we did it one time, yeah. And mm-hmm. uh, other things they produce in, in, in great quantities, soybean, corn, pork, wheat, uh, you have customers such as Japan, Mexico, China, South Korea, Canada, the EU, Taiwan, and Colombia. Number one producer popcorn in the U.S. Yep, number one Yum. popcorn. Uh, so we're uh, number two in ethanol, uh, number two in cattle on um, well, all cows and calves. I think we're number two in cattle on feed. We're number one in commercial red meat slaughter. Mm-hmm. So, and we're actually the, the biggest state for ag receipts, rec- um, ag receipts per capita. Wow. Number one in that, and number three overall. Uh, didn't know there were, I didn't know there was any wine in Nebraska. Apparently it has more than 30 wineries and tasting rooms. Lots of wineries, also lots of wow. breweries too. Wow, uh-oh. Don't, don't want to lose the breweries too, but we've got a lot of craft okay. breweries too. That's been exploding. Got Sophie's attention. Yep. And can you briefly talk about Omaha's Henry Dorley Zoo? Number one Aquarium. zoo in the country. We actually have a staffer here. He brought back pictures. They were there like last week or so. It was Beautiful. He was there with his kids. Amazing pictures. There was an aquarium tunnel. They had penguins in the background. Oh my gosh! Desert Desert Dome. Really cool. The Desert Dome. I didn't even know about it. Baby elephants. Yeah, (gasps) all sorts of stuff. I'm sold. And here's the other cool thing about it: almost 100% privately funded. Wow. Yeah. So we, we, when I was governor, we did give them a little bit of a rebate on the sales tax, but (laughs) small. (laughs) <laughs> Sounds beautiful. And lots to do in Nebraska. Any final thoughts, Senator? Oh, we got Don't forget the College World Series. Okay. And uh, Warren Buffett's uh, Berkshire annual meeting that they have there. So both those events draw literally tens of thousands of people to Omaha. And of course, we've got great natural beauty. It is, if you're thinking Nebraska's flat, it's because you've driven along I-80. And it goes through the Platte River Valley. They put I-80 there for a reason because that's the flat part of the state. You get outside the Platte River Valley and it's rolling hills. And actually, if you go from the eastern side, it's about 1,000 feet in elevation. If you get to the western side, it's over 5,000 feet in elevation. So you have actually parts of Nebraska look like Colorado. Wow, so, yeah. I didn't know that. So very diverse topography okay. all around the state. Unfortunate we have to let you go, Senator. So one final question, long sword or battle axe? I'm a big fan of the long sword. It's probably just a little bit more versatile, but the battle axe does look cool. There's your Dungeons so. and Dragons tip. <laughs> Senator, thank you for being today's The Elephant in the Room. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me on. Thanks. If you enjoyed this podcast, check out one of our other episodes. You want to hear how House Speaker Kevin McCarthy got in a fist fight with another member drawing blood? Check out episode 102 with Senator Mark Wayne Mullen. And if you hit that subscribe button, You'll be notified each time a new episode comes out. The Elephant in the Room is brought to you under the direction of U.S. Senator John Barrasso of Wyoming. Arjun Modi is our executive producer. Carly Rapp keeps us in line. And Elena Seiler keeps us on the line to make sure you can hear us. Until next time, this has been The Elephant in the Room.